Okay, we'll get started. Um, hopefully everyone can uh, hear me. Uh, my name is Nikkel Allen. I'm the director of Open Government and um, the Office of Open Government is presenting Open Meetings Act training for local school advisory teams um, this evening. I wanna thank all of you for participating. I mean, also thank you for your service um, to your school system and the District of Columbia government for serving on the local school advisory team. Um, Attorney Johnny Barton from the Office of Open Government will be facilitating the training. Uh, Attorney Barton is a, a DC government expert. Um, he has been in the government for some time and um, is an Open Meetings Act and FOIA expert um, as well. He has been in private practice um, as well as he worked for the District of Columbia Council. Um, Mr. Barton's presentation will be uh, approximately one hour uh, and after he's finished his presentation, if you have any um, questions, you'll be able to, to um, ask him at this time, that time. Um, I also, um, before we get started, I ask everyone to um, mute your line um, until the question um, and answer period begins. Okay, I'm going to turn over um, the presentation to uh, Johnny Barton. Thank you, Director Allen. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for participating. And thank you for taking time out to participate in this teleconference training on the Open Meetings Act. I want to start off by uh, giving you a little illustration, a real estate transaction that will help, hopefully help you to remember uh, some of the major components of the Open Meetings Act. Um, if you had a property that you wanted to rent, uh, one of the things that you would want to do, of course, is to advise, is, is to advertise that property. And you would advertise it probably in one of three ways, uh, electronically over the internet, by physically posting a uh, for rent sign, and by also using the uh, media print. You're also gonna keep records once you rent that property. You can keep records of the rent payments, uh, any problems with the property, uh, any communications with your, your uh, tenant. And if all does not go well, uh, if something goes terribly wrong, then you have to enforce uh, the lease. So if you can remember advertisement, uh, recording, and enforcement, uh, you'll have a handle on some of the major components of the Open Meetings Act. Next. OK, ready for the next screen? Director Allen, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Are we ready for the next screen? Okay, I'm at OOG Mission. Um, okay. okay. The, the uh, mission of the Office of Open Government is to ensure that government operations are at every level are transparent, open to the public, and promote civic engagement. The Office of Open Government is actually an independent office in the Board of Ethics and Government Accountability. It was established by statute in 2011, and it was first um, um, uh, stood up in 2013. The office has statutory charge over two areas of the law, FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act, and the Open Meetings Act, of course. With regards to FOIA, the office issues advisory opinions, which are non-binding uh, to uh, public bodies. And it also assists both public bodies and members of the public in either um, submitting a FOIA request or uh, providing the records to, uh, to meet that FOIA request. With regards to the Open Meetings Act, the office uh, conducts training like this one this evening. It also provides um, uh, interpretations of the Open Meetings Act and it enforces the Open Meetings Act. Get ready for the next. Okay, Direct Allen is still uh, on 
the first page of me. Okay. Um, Is everyone seeing my screen? Um, okay. Perfectly technical. Um, hold on one second. Okay, you might need to switch your, your view. Um, I, I'm fine if everyone else can see it. Okay. Um, so what, what we're on, um, make this larger again. We're on, on slide um, number three. And that's open meetings? Yeah, that's open meetings. Okay. Welcome. Um, I just heard someone else join. Um, this is the Open Meetings Act training um, for the local school advisory team. Okay. On slide number four. First, we need to establish what uh, a, a meeting is. A meeting is a gathering of a quorum of the members of a public body with those public body members gather together to conduct and advise or advise on public business. Public business includes gathering information, taking testimony, discussing, deliberating, recommending, and voting. And the meetings may be held by telephone conference, video conference, or by other electronic means of communication. There are certain things which are not a meeting. Um, I like to use an illustration of uh, a group of a quorum of the members of a public body uh, winding up at Costco at the same time. It's a holiday season and it may happen. Uh, because it's a chance uh, gathering and it's not uh, a, for the purpose of uh, conducting official business, it's not a, an open meeting. So a chance gathering or a social gathering where no business is discussed does not come under the Open Meetings Act nor does a press conference. If a public body um, does not have a quorum, it cannot conduct a meeting by taking any official action. It can take the roll call of the meeting, um, mention that there is no quorum, and it can adjourn. What are open meetings? An open meeting is open to the public if the public is permitted to be physically present, the news media is permitted to be physically present, or the meeting is televised. It must be open to the public unless one of the statutory reasons, which we'll go over a little later, are um, permitted to close that portion of the meeting. There are a couple things that are also not meetings. Email exchanges between members of a public body are not an electronic meeting, nor are subcommittee meetings. And some public bodies will delegate uh, authority to a subcommittee to uh, do a certain function and report back to the main uh, body on a matter. Unless the subcommittee consists of a quorum and its purpose is to evade the Open Meetings Act, uh, it does not fall under the, under the Open Meetings Act. Okay, our next slide is telling us the definition of some of the public bodies that are subject to the OMA. The Government Council, including the DC City Council, 
boards, commissions, or similar entities, a board that supervises or controls an agency, an advisory board that takes official action by the vote of its members convened for such purpose. There are some exclusions under the Open Meetings Act. These include government bodies of public charter schools, the mayor's cabinet, professional or administrative staff of public bodies when gathered outside the presence of a quorum, and ANCs or advisory neighborhood commissions, which are subject to a uh, different law. Now, remember with our real estate transaction, one of the things we wanted to do was to notify the public that that property is available. Well, it's no different under the Open Meetings Act, because one of the things that we want to do, we want to encourage the public to attend the meeting. The only way that the public can know that we're uh, holding a meeting is if they receive notice. And how are there are certain notification requirements under the Open Meetings Act? I noticed uh, in the guidelines that the guidelines, I believe, stipulate 20 days before the uh, meeting occurs. And that's fine because under the OMA, the law actually says as early as possible, but notice must be given 48 hours or two business days before the meeting occurs, whichever is greater. Now, how is the notification going to be given to the public? It's going to be given the same way as we advertise that property for rent. It's going to be physically posted in the office of the public body or where the public body meets or a place that's readily accessible to the public. It's going to be uh, electronically uh, public posted on the website of the public body. And I believe each LSAT has a, uh, a website or should have a website or the public or the District of Columbia's website. It's also going to be publicized in the um, DC register. And uh, we understand that there is an issue with that. And we believe that we've had a, um, a, a means to, uh, to resolve that. Uh, the director has um, opined that for the instance of LSATs, uh, they can publicize on our central meeting calendar rather than in the DC register. And there's going to be two um, notification requirements. One is of your upcoming meetings. The other is of your annual schedule of meetings, which you also are publicizing on your website. Now, the notice has to conclude some things because, of course, uh, we want people to come, and the only way that people can come is if they have these specifics. The notice must include the time, the date, the location, and a draft meeting agenda. If the public body is going to go into a closed or an executive session, that um, notice must include um, a notice of intent to go into closure and a citation from the OMA justifying the reason for closure. We'll go over those reasons for going into a closed and executive session in just a few minutes. Also at the end of your agendas, whether it's a uh, draft agenda or a final meeting agenda, you have to include this language. This meeting is governed by the Open Meetings Act. Please address any questions or complaints arising under this meeting to the Office of Open Government at opengovoffice at dc.gov. I mentioned a minute ago that a public body can go into a closed or an executive session. In the uh, DC Code, in the Open Meetings Act, there are actually 14 reasons that are listed. And we have um, kind of Combine them a little bit so that you can um, readily ascertain those. If a court order or a statute authorizes a public body to go into a closed session, it may. For certain negotiations, certain contract negotiations, or attorney client privilege, not simply because an attorney is present at the meeting, but if the attorney is there to actually give uh, the, the, the LSAT uh, legal advice. Trade secrets, testing or grading, uh, to discuss personnel issues. Um, if there is a training, such as we're having uh, this evening, uh, to discuss 
collective bargaining negotiations, or to administer, prepare, or grade tests, or where a public body uh, serves as a quasi-judicial quasi body, um, such as the Board of Zoning, uh, the ABC Board. Uh, you can go into a closed session to deliberate uh, for public safety reasons and to conduct an investigation. A public body may not merely just go into a closed session. There's a protocol that must be followed for entering into a closed or an executive session. First, you're going to open the meeting and establish that you have a quorum. Um, a motion is to be made to enter into the closed or executive session. Uh, that motion should be second. And the motion must include a reference to the OM site, OMA citation to justify the closed or executive session. And the presiding officer of the public body is the one who's going to, uh, to uh, move us into a closed or an executive session. Uh, you have to take a roll call vote, and if the motion passes, enter into a closed or an executive session. One of the things that we do again is we're going to notice the uh, public of the meeting, and that meeting agenda, that draft agenda is going to list, uh, if we're going into a closed session, the reason we're going into closure. So once a public body does lawfully go into a closed or an executive session, we can only discuss those matters that's, uh, that are addressed in the draft meeting agenda. You also must record what is discussed in the executive session, and we'll get into that uh, a little later, but you have to record it by electronic means. All meetings, whether open or closed, must be recorded by electronic means. After uh, completing your business in the closed or executive session, you reopen the public meeting and where appropriate, report publicly any official action taken in closure and adjourn. In our real estate transaction, we talked about recording a certain information. Well, there are recording requirements under the OMA. All meetings, whether they are open or closed, must be recorded by electronic means. That can be an audio recording or video recording. Um, it can also be done by a transcript. And we ask that if you do have a transcriber, uh, uh, keep your, your minutes, that you confer with them to make sure that there's no copyright restrictions with posting uh, meeting minutes publicly. A public body should also keep detailed meeting minutes. What are detailed meeting minutes? Detailed meeting minutes are more than just bullet notes or bullet points. Detailed meeting minutes basically describe what happened in detail. Uh, if there was a vote, who voted what, uh, what public business was discussed, uh, it's Detailed enough that if someone was to look at those minutes a week or a day later, they would be able to ascertain what took place at the meeting. The minutes have to also be made available to the public. As opined by the Director of Open Government, draft detailed meeting minutes must be publicly available no later than three business days after the meeting. Okay. So order recordings or video recordings or transcript, a copy of that full record must be made available no later than seven business days. I'm an American outside meeting, got a PTA meeting to go to. After the meeting. Um, I think there's someone who, need, who needs to mute themselves. We can hear a conversation. Um, if you don't mind muting yourself, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Director Allen. You're welcome. With regard to uh, how long to keep your records, the OMA requires preservation of all meeting records for a minimum of five years. Um, one of the things that we do recommend to public bodies is if they are keeping audio recordings that they have a um, a, a an independent uh, drive where they can store that information. Uh, 
with regard to uh, their paper records, if they can keep those electronically. Uh, but please don't destroy any of your records, even after the five-year period. Uh, the DC government general record schedules uh, require that uh, all public bodies and agencies contact uh, the archivist once they're done with the records after that five-year period, and the archivist will dis will direct you as to what to do with the records at that time. Hello, we're still hearing someone um, talking. Thank you. There's some other requirements under the OMA. Does the public have a right to comment? Only if the public body enabling legislation uh, mandates appear to public comment. However, we encourage all public bodies uh, in the spirit of openness and transparency uh, to allow the public um, for a period of comment. A public body, even independent of legal authority to do so, may allow for a period of public comment. If you do allow a period of public comment, uh, you have the right to regulate the time allowed it and the duration of public comments unless those requirements are already spelled out in uh, your enabling this legislation or your bylaws. Rules of parliamentary procedure. A public body may conduct a public meeting using the latest edition of Robert's Rules of Order. And that's something that the uh, director of open government recommends and the director may provide advice and training on parliamentary procedure. So if you want to uh, use Robert's rules of order and there's a need for um, training, uh, please contact uh, the, the office and the, uh, we'll make sure that uh, that parliamentary uh, procedure training is provided to you. Sometimes it may be necessary to, uh, to cancel a meeting. And a meeting cancellation is under the OMA, a change in schedule. Please provide as much notice as possible. However, in some instances, you may not be able to. Um, so require, um, if you can't give um, a week in advance or two weeks in advance, um, the OMA suggests that you provide at least 48 hours or two business days, whichever is greater, before the meeting was to occur. In some instances, if there's a freak snowstorm or something, of course, you can't provide uh, that amount of notice, but provide as much notice as you can to the public that the meeting is going to be canceled. Once you cancel a meeting, it's very important to keep and to establish a record that that meeting was canceled. Um, when you uh, keep elect, when you keep a, um, when you public, when you post it electronically uh, on your website, you want to uh, just simply put canceled by a meeting that didn't occur. That way the public is aware that that meeting didn't occur and will not be looking for any records of the meeting. Public bodies can also hold electronic meetings. A public body can meet via video, electronic conference or other electronic means. However, uh, you must make reasonable arrangements for the public's right to attend. Uh, if you were doing a teleconference, uh, you would, of course, do like we're doing this evening. There would be a dial-in number for the public to use. And if you had to go into a closed session, uh, you could have a separate line or separate number for the uh, members to dial into when you go into a closed or an executive center. That meeting, of course, has to be recorded. All votes must be taken by roll call and all other provisions of the Open Meetings Act must be adhered to. In some instances, it becomes necessary, it may become necessary for a public body to hold 
and emergency meeting. Um, if you hold an emergency meeting, the notification requirements are a little different than for a regular meeting. Instead of as much notice as possible or 48 hours or two business days, whichever is greater, before the meeting is to occur, uh, you must give notice to the public at the same time notice is given to the members. So if you decide uh, if there's a decision made tomorrow at noon that you're going to have a um, emergency meeting on Friday, then give the public as much notice as possible, which is um, providing notice at the same time the notice is given to uh, the members of the LSAT. The presiding officer is going to open the meeting with a statement explaining the subject of the meeting, the nature of the emergency, and how public notice was provided. One of the statutory charges of the Office of Open Government is to enforce violations of the Open Meetings Act. Uh, we do periodically receive complaints uh, concerning public bodies, uh, non-compliance with uh, certain provisions of the Open Meetings Act, not keeping uh, records or not uh, making those records public timely, um, or going into a closed or executive session for an improper reason and the like. A, a complaint um, can be filed by a aggrieved party and it can be filed anonymously um, and um, for relief if a meeting may have been conducted in violation of the OMA. And what happens in the um, grand scheme of things when we receive a complaint is our first course of action is to uh, acknowledge the complaint, but also to uh, notify the public body of the complaint and ask them to provide any information uh, that will help support their case that there's not a violation. In some instances, um, it's not a violation at all. It's just something was missed. Someone looked in the wrong place to find the meeting minutes, or someone simply didn't see, see the meeting minutes, but they were actually timely published. Complaints may refer to past meetings. They can be submitted in writing, in person, online, by mail, or email. Generally, uh, we have 14 business days to resolve a complaint, uh, but that usually does not happen because we have to uh, give the public body time to provide uh, its response to the complaint. And we resolve complaints in one of a few ways. Um, we dismiss the complaint because some complaints don't have any merit. We issue a binding opinion, or if the uh, parties, particularly the complainant, is uh, willing to, we go into a period of conciliation to see if we can resolve the matter that way. Under the OMA, certain um, appeals, certain uh, opinions from the director can be appealed by a, uh, an aggrieved party. Um, an aggrieved party may appeal to the Board of Ethics and Government Accountability, or BEGA, for reconsideration of an OMA opinion issued by the director uh, in response to a public official or an employee's request for advice or that is issued without outside prompting. So if one of the LSATs um, asked uh, the director for advice on a matter and um, uh, once that opinion is issued, if the LSAT um, is um, adverse to the uh, opinion, they can um, appeal to the a board for a reconsideration. And there are specific regulations that govern the time uh, in, involved in, 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 a, in appeal. We're going to make sure that you have a, um, um, a copy of the, um, the, the Open Meetings Act that was discussed this evening. Um, 
at the end of that presentation, um, there's an Open Meetings Act summary, which gives you the long and the short of what we have discussed this evening. And this time, I want to ask if there are any questions. Are there any questions? Um, I've unmuted everyone if there um, are any questions or, or even comments. Um, you know, we, are, we are happy to receive them. Um, well, but this is Cedric Hendricks from School of Our Office. Yes. Just thank you for the opportunity. I think sharing information like this. I have a question. I have a question. Helps all of us uh, do our job better. So thank you for it. No, you're welcome. Um, yes, I heard there was a question. Yeah, I have a question. Um, so I understand the policy is to post the minutes three days after the meeting, but we prefer to post them after the LSAT has approved them at the next meeting in case anybody has any additions or changes. Is that okay? Well, the, the 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 minutes that you're going to post in three days are going to be draft, and um, and so of course they won't be become final until the public body until the LSAT meets again to approve them. So they'll be draft, and you can actually put uh, you know draft on the 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 meeting minutes and a note that says that um, um, you know they'll be approved uh, at the next register scheduled meeting of the LSAT. Three days also just doesn't seem like a lot of time, like for for the secretary to like write them up and get them posted. Well, um, if you record the meeting by electronic means, uh, you can post that recording in lieu of the uh, meeting minutes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sure. You're welcome. Any other questions or comments or um, general thoughts on this process? I know it's new. Um, so uh, again, I just also want to say we're here to help you um, to, to comply with the Open Meetings Act. Um, and we're always here if you have any questions. Um, so if you can't think of anything tonight, um, that's fine. Um, you can send us an email. Um, I think everyone received the presentation handouts. If you did not, um, if you could um, contact us or contact um, Eli, I believe, um, is the um, person from DCPS who distributed um, the material. Um, so, uh, you know, again, let us know. I mean, if you know of someone who was not able to attend or who had technical difficulties, um, we are hoping that the, the video was recorded properly, so we'll be able to um, provide a copy for you um, at a later time. Um, and also, if you'd like us to come to your um, LSAT meeting and, and train you in person, we're also available to do that as well. Let me say, you mentioned that the, this is Cedric again, that the presentation handouts were sent out by email. Yeah. I don't think I've seen that yet, but, um, okay. but I'll double check. Okay. Um, there should be a, fee a comment feature here. Um, if you can send me your email address, I'll, I'll e email it to you and anyone else who may not have the handouts. Um, if you can um, send me an email address. Um, well, actually, um, then, that, then I'll, we'll make sure to send it to you. And my email is my first name, which is spelled N as in Nancy, I U E L L E dot A L L E N at dc.gov. This is Katie Mustion. I work for DC Public Schools on the Community Action Team, and we did hyperlink um, the materials from this webinar in the reminder or invitation email that went out today that had this hyperlink. So if you read down just a little bit further, it's hyperlinked there, um, but you can also find it in the LSAT toolkit. 
if you go to the, um, there's like a subfolder in the LSAT toolkit um, called webinars, and it's got all the webinars from the last three school years, um, and it's in this year's folder, so you can find it there too. So I joined by phone, so did the handouts have the instructions for how you submit your meeting dates to the uh, DC register? Well, you all are not going to be required uh, to uh, submit to the DC register. Uh, you all will be using our central meeting calendar uh, as well as your own website to, um, to, 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 to publish your notices and your calendar of uh, yearly meetings. And we're working now with uh with eli and ebony uh over in the um general counsel's office to work out and finalize a procedure so that uh, you all will be able to do so and um you, you you will get instructions on how to uh use the central meeting calendar i'm not high tech i can use it so it's really simple to use um and we have an it person tiffany montgomery uh, who will be available to assist you if you do have any issues with uh, posting to the central meeting calendar. What are you guys doing? Legit going okay, thank you. Now? You're welcome. Okay. Um, if there are no other questions, um, we'll end the meeting. Um, again, thank you so much for participating, and thank you for your service um, to the district government and DC public schools as a member of the local school advisory team. I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, honestly, like be careful throughout the top of the stairs. Yeah, that's actually. That's it. Hey, Nikhil, can you still hear me? Yeah, I can still hear you. Um, hold on a second. Let me, I'm going to end the meeting. I'll call you um, uh, Yeah, I'll call you. <laughs> Hopefully when we do this again, I'll be better at this. Or Tiffany will be able to do it. Okay, I'm, I'm ending the meeting now. Call you in a second. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.